Salaam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching The Daily Debrief. On this week's starting episode today, we're looking at the crucial issues in the US midterm elections that are coming up on the 8th of November. We'll also look at how they will impact wider global uh, geopolitics, including what possible impacts they might have on peace in Ukraine and Russia with News Click Editor-in-Chief Prabir Pukayastha. And finally, we'll look at the Indian Olympic Association and how its new constitution might provide a framework for countries from the global south and how they govern sports. First up, the US midterm general elections, like I was just saying, take place on November the 8th. And though the news might have us believe that Twitter is where the election is decided, it turns out there's a lot more to it than just that. The Biden administration and the Democratic Party at large has struggled since assuming office to differentiate itself in any meaningful way from the legacy left by the Trump years. Polity has perhaps never been as fractured or polarized, and discourse is continually moving into the realm of the bizarre. People's Dispatch's Anish follows US politics very closely and spoke to us earlier via video conference for an internationalist perspective, of course, looking at the key domestic local issues as well, on why these elections are important and what the key issues in the US are. Anish, another important election, as all US elections are, I guess, and, and uh, they are perpetually uh, in this sort of election cycle, uh, what, ahead of the midterms, just ahead of the midterms, uh, November 8th is when, uh, Tuesday is when those, uh, when voting takes place. What are some of the critical issues and why are we watching this election so closely? Well, a lot of things are, uh, uh, like a lot of factors come into play right now. And some of the things that we need to note is how certain issues, certain key issues have taken center stage right now, nationally speaking. Uh, and that will be at the heart of the election campaign. Uh, obviously, the economy uh, and inflation, rising spiraling inflation is part of the, uh, is actually the biggest uh, campaign issue right now, which is where the Democrats are kind of floundering because a whole host of uh, measures that they had promised uh, during, uh, before the elections in 2020, uh, they could not or did not uh, pass uh, or they were reluctant to go through it un until there was like a popular upsurge uh, demanding for these things. Uh, there were also issues of uh, how Biden's, uh, Biden administration's performance has been over the past two years. And that will obviously also affect how it is going to uh, take, uh, you know, the kind of results that will happen uh, that we will see in the next day uh, after the elections. Now, uh, but there is also one uh, important factor that will be not just a part of the campaign issue, but will also be part of ballot measures in at least six states, which is abortion right. Uh, this is right after the Roe versus Wade being overturned. We had uh, a, a series of state uh, legislatures trying to push for uh, different kinds of uh, legislations that can actually limit abortion or make them criminal in some uh, in some cases, and uh, and we saw what happened in Kansas, where a measure of that, uh, an attempt of that sort, was defeated by a public referendum. Now six states will be going through the same sort of referendum. One of them, at least Kentucky, is uh, will be having the same kind of question that Kansas did, because it's a state-led referendum. Uh, in three other cases, uh, you have. Uh, wording that will actually enshrine abortion and uh, and, uh, uh, and access to contraceptives as part of health care and as, uh, an in, as an essential part of the Constitution as well. And then there is at least one which will uh, change the kind of way uh, uh, access to health care will be given to babies who are still alive. It's, it's a very weird set of terms but still alive uh, after an, an attempted abortion, but whatever it be. But yeah, so we have, at least in such cases, uh, abortion being a, center, a central issue right now. And uh, the results on that will be crucial in how uh, the movement for reproductive rights will move forward. Obviously, Democrats are trying to uh, put their, uh, their entire force behind such thing, because obviously that has helped them in Kansas. They saw the kind of uh, popular upsurge uh, that actually led to it being uh, approved by a vast majority of people. And so another another uh, 
crucial public referendum that we need to talk about is what is happening in Tennessee, which will be having a series of four such uh, constitutional amendment up for ballot. And one of that will be to, uh, which will actually weaken unions. Uh, another, which will actually repeal uh, slavery and uh, forced servitude as a criminal uh, uh, offense in the state. And so we are talking about, and another that will actually uh, uh, that will actually take out measures that will that disqualifies ministers and religious figures from contesting elections. So we are looking at a very crucial set of, like obviously it's a state level issue, but uh, if you look at the general overall tendency and when it comes to labor movements right now, when it comes to uh, you know changing or uh, revision, uh, revising history and other measures that actually gives religious uh, fanatics more control, this is these are definitely some important measures that we need to watch out of. What, what are the prospects for the Democratic Party? Uh, not looking too good, uh, it has to be said. Yes, so obviously there has been a record for decades now where the sitting president's party often loses in the midterms. Now, this is also something that the Democrats are expecting at this at the moment right now. Uh, we are talking about leads uh, that range from between 1% to 5%, in, uh, depending on the poll that you're talking about, but uh, at least in the House elections, the House of Representatives elections. Now, that is where the Democrats often had an edge in the previous, the last half of the Trump administration. In both the cases, uh, the, the especially the progressives, uh, could lead through some of the legislation that were important. Now, the thing is that losing that to the Republicans after four years would actually have a bigger problem in their hand because that would mean uh, not only uh, a half and half in the Senate, but also a complete uh, blockade that can happen if the, Repub if the more Trumpite Republicans, especially uh, gains uh, strength in the House of Representatives. And this could mean that the next half of the Biden administration is going to be grim, to, uh, to put it more delicately. Yeah. Uh, we need to also remember that, uh, that the manner in which obviously it is a referendum uh, of how the government performed, but uh, the voter turnout will also be quite significant uh, because we need to remember that uh, very often midterms do not have high voter turnout. Uh, as compared to the general elections, the president, which happens along with the presidential elections, right. uh, and if that, uh, if the voter turnout is still low, that means that the, the historic tendency would continue, and Republicans could win a majority, not just in the House but also the Senate, and that means uh, an, uh, the Congress and the presidency being at loggerheads with each mm -hmm. other. That could also mean. They will just blo be blocking a whole host of measures, not just uh, domestic measures, but also foreign policy measures. In some cases, that could be good, but in a whole host of other things, especially when it comes to uh, you know progressive legislations that are still under consideration, that could mean a bigger problem for the people of the US. All right. Thanks very much for summing up what is actually a vast array of uh, issues, Anish. And we'll, of course, have you back on the show to talk about uh, results and the impact of those results as and when uh, we have them. Thanks again. On Friday last week, German Chancellor Olaf Schulz went to China, despite what a large section of the Western press are calling both domestic as well as international skepticism about the visit. The skepticism, of course, might come from only certain parties. Schulz is the first leader from the so-called G7 grouping of industrialized nations to go to China since the pandemic broke and reported himself on having ca had candid conversations with President Xi Jinping on a wide range of issues. Perhaps most importantly, the two leaders agreeing that threats to use nuclear weapons, irrespective of where they might come from, are irres irresponsible and not in the general interests of the planet. News League Editor-in-Chief Prabir Purkayastha is with us in studio to talk more about this visit and what wider ramifications it might have in the weeks and months to come. Uh, Prabir, good to have you back in the studio. Uh, a lot of uh, sort of commentary on the meeting between Germany and China and the implications it might have. You've, of course, been following very closely both the narrative that is being built as well as uh, the content of some of these conversations and the statements that have been made uh, when the meetings took place. W what do you make of it? What is your reading of the situation? Well, it was quite a surprise. Why did Scholz go to beat uh, Xi 
presidency at all mm. because it didn't appear that there was something cooking mm. on both sides. So only thing that we can read between the lines that Germany at the moment does feel that it needs to at least try and build an independent uh, identity for itself in the Ukraine-Russia crisis and perhaps try to build some bridges with China. There has also been talk about China and uh, Germany's relationships, economic ones. Mm. There is also the issue that the German economy is facing a huge crisis, particularly because of the energy price rise and therefore how its engineering and other goods, chemicals, metals, all these things, all machine them. tools, all of this are at risk. The German economy is in a huge risk because of this. And therefore, is there a way for Germany now to come out of what they see as a crisis of Ukraine, in which it is going to be the most hit? Hmm. In fact, in economic terms, it's Germany, the preeminent economic power in uh, Europe. Europe that's going to be hit the most. And if that happens, of course, other countries in Europe will also face the consequences. But the, really the heavyweight there hmm. is really Germany. Hmm. And therefore, is Scholz trying to work out something with uh, President Xi in terms of an intervention post the midterm elections in the United States, at which time possibly there might be an opening for trying to get Russia and Ukraine back to the uh, discussions back to talking to each other and therefore a path to a peace agreement mm. which if you remember in the first two months of the war yeah. it seems they were very near an agreement mm. which finally uh, didn't That's work out Zelensky yeah. walked out of it and till uh, till then uh, till that point of time, we thought that maybe there is a quick war. It will get to resolution on the basis of the Minsk Accords and some amount of autonomy for the, uh, the Russian-speaking population in the Donetsk region. None of that happened. Mm. And there's been, till from that time, there's been talk only of a victory of Ukraine, which looking at the military scenario is impossible. And the fact that now, the, I think it's increasingly dawning on Europe more mm. than the United States, that this is a war they are going to lose heavily. So is this a rethinking on Scholz's part, therefore reaching out to Xi? You talked about the headlines. The headlines mm. have been that, oh, Germany and China have condemned Russia on the issue of a nuclear bomb explosion in Ukraine. Since Putin never talked about a nuclear bomb being exploded uh, uh, on Ukraine. In fact, he said, if the existence of Russia is threatened, we have discussed this earlier, mm. in which case all weapons that we have is at our disposal, which is actually the nuclear posture review of the United States as well, which is what they have expanded more on that recently, as we have as discussed. discussed yeah. So this is not the really, not the issue, which is what the um, headlines seem to suggest. It is something more that is happening, which perhaps we will see something after the bitter with the U.S. and mm. maybe in the in Bali, where all these leaders will be there. Probably so maybe me. something may have may have come out there. So that's something to watch. Mm. I think uh, also Schulz himself wrote an editorial that seemed like a justification of the entire visit, uh, and in that uh, an element that did stand out was that we do live in a multipolar world. Something that increasingly the United States uh, doesn't seem to officially recognize, but uh, in like cases such as this, might be forced to. Uh, how, how do you see uh, that element of geopolitics kind of playing forward, leading up to post, post the midterms and Biden's weakness and leading into the G20 summit? Well, I think a lot of uh, question marks over there, mm. because if the Republicans uh, emerge stronger, what is their position going to be the Ukraine war? There have been marches now in Italy, for instance, against the Ukraine war. Right. There are other places, movements are starting to take place, talking about peace in Ukraine. Mm. We don't want to uh, continue with the war in Ukraine. Mm. The problems of how to fund Ukraine, because there's a huge uh, yawning uh, more of uh, money yeah, yeah. that is going down and we don't know where it's going, weapons, etc. So there is a huge drain that is taking place and European Union, we've always discussed, is a net loser mm. because it's not a major military power, mm. it's an economic uh, power at best and given the way the sanctions are operating and what the US is asking uh, European Union to do, that not buy from Russia, 
oil and gas, but at the same time pay much more money much to the United States yeah. for the LNG that they're supplying. So given all of that, I think Europe, whether it will be able to maintain its economic autonomy is a big question. Mm. And uh, should the, why, if you remember the old slogan that we, the first head of NATO used to uh, gave, that basically NATO is a way to keep Germany down, Russia out, and the US in mm. Europe. Mm. Now, that was the argument given. Mm. So whether the Europeans recognize this and is there going to be change? And I think the net thing, net reality is if Europe is willing to deal with Russia on, in terms of oil, gas, coal, fertilizers, etc., and with China on the question of manufactured goods, if they can mobilize the trade on that count and get a peace in Europe, Europe get Ukraine to come to the peace table, I think that will be a step forward for the, forward for the world. Mm. Otherwise, this is a destructive battle is going to cause enormous losses for everybody, including the crisis in the United States itself. Yeah what we're seeing in terms of inflation yeah. and also lack of uh, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I so I think that all of this, the economic crisis is not going to be for Russia, Ukraine, U Europe alone. It's mm. going to be a global, global crisis. crisis. You already yeah. see that yeah. Com uh, continuation of what is called stagflation. Mm. Inflation on one hand and stagnation, if not a recession, recession. At, at home. So all of this portend a need for a peace initiative Absolutely. and hopefully, hopefully, Scholz and uh, she Gee. have been discussing it. Hopefully, Jay Shankar is, been dis is going to discuss it uh, in his visit to Russia mm. and hopefully some thawing may take place behind the scenes in Bali. Yeah. As, as there are hopefully some indicators of as uh, a piece on News Click by Ambassador Badr Kumar also seems to indicate uh, that, that, that some thaw or some change in the stance uh, at least um, be between the lines, is beginning to happen and hopefully that proceeds. Uh, we'll of course have you back, Praveer, uh, very soon to discuss the upcoming G20 summit and also post uh, the midterms how things will play out and the scenario might look then. But thanks for the update today. At the moment, it's very much between the lines. Yeah. So we still don't see outside the lines what's yeah. happening. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, Praveer. And finally, the Indian Olympic Association, the body responsible for all things that have anything to do with Olympic sports and games, now has a new constitution. Uh, of course, this applies to India. This is in line with the changing needs of our times. For example, keep taking into consideration the climate crisis, the new document governing how much of sport will march into the future is being celebrated as the first of its kind for a couple of reasons. Prime among them are athlete representation in decision making and gender equality. Senior sports journalist Sharda Ugra spoke to us via video conference for more details. Sharda, welcome back to the show. Uh, you uh, were very pleased when you read uh, this new draft uh, constitution that might be the way forward for uh, the Olympic movement in India and therefore impact the direction in which much of sport will take in this country. Uh, but we're also looking at it from a slightly international perspective and how this could in, in the ways that, or the new elements that are being proposed, uh, provide a sort of roadmap or a template for other Olympic committees uh, to also uh, build on, particularly in a couple of key areas. So I think the first thing that we want to get from you is a sense of uh, athlete representation in the decision making of the Indian Olympic Association and how that, in your opinion, is a positive step forward. Uh, it's it, it's quite a uh, radical. I mean, we met when we when this thing first came to to uh, to our notice. It's quite a radical document in the sense, uh, but I think that's we are looking at it from an Indian point of view uh, because of the fact that you've got eight athletes that will be nominated or elected by the athletes commission, and athletes commission will have to be formed. Now in India, athletes have never had that kind of power that you see that they may have in other countries in in sort of developed sporting countries. Uh, but if you could do this in India if it can actually come mean something uh, i think that there is a great uh, uh, opportunity for countries that are there athletes uh, from countries in the global south to be able to 
uh, say, look, this is happening here. Why can it not happen with us? You know, and this has the approval of the International Olympic Committee, which is very, very important. Now, uh, to a lot of ways, eight looks like a very small number in a large gathering of uh, sports officials, but uh, it's better than zero. It's eight times more than it used to be. And this is like a stricture that's been there. Now, we know that on the 10th, uh, this is when this whole thing will come to uh, pass uh, with the general assembly, with the assembly of the IOA meeting to say, okay, we stand by it. Right. The other couple of things that are mentioned, and again, of course, these are, these are sort of guidelines or it's a charter. So in that sense, there, there's very little in terms of specific programs that might uh, come into place because of these changes. But, uh, but there is a focus on anti-discrimination, whether on the grounds of race, religion, uh, gender, uh, ethnicity, any of these things, language, of course, uh, and a focus on environment or being responsible or recognizing environmental concerns, which is, which is a major thing. COP27, of course, uh, is starting today. And, uh, you know, the global south, like you were mentioning, we have, uh, and South Asia in particular, is facing the brunt of the impact of human-induced climate change. Uh, so in that sense, it appears to be forward-looking. Is it just language or do you think that this will actually have an impact on how programs and policies are designed going forward? I think uh, the the presence of these of, of these sort of uh, uh, phrases or this kind of documentation about anti discrimination in some way about uh, being careful about uh, uh, the impact on climate these are important because it gives every but one outside of the sporting ecosystem a chance to see how our sport are being run and maybe question some things that we take for granted you know that, that okay is it sport we have to do it. We have to be uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, it, it's fine to do these kind of things. So I think the fact that it's there in language, of course, you will need to, uh, uh, but it gives everyone who is concerned about these issues almost like a, a line of defense to say, look, this is unacceptable and it's unacceptable here and I can take this forward. I think mm -hmm. uh, sexual orientation will also be uh, anti-discrimination -dis against sexual orientation is a very important uh, clause to put down there and say, look, this is not acceptable. If you treat people like this because in India we've seen that there are so many uh, injustices that take place uh, um, against athletes using all these uh, you know ethnicity language what are to be uh, uh, sexual orientation uh, imagined mm. or real um, that mm. it, it's important for this to be there because it is it is a way through it's almost like a tool with which or, or a weapon with which anyone who is um, actions taken against them can actually stand up and say this is uh, unacceptable. So they may it may look like words at the moment, but uh, it, uh, uh, these are solid words. I'm glad that they're there. I think yeah, you've you've summed it up pretty clearly. And and an important point you make there that like if the Olympic movement is something that happens from the ground up and is meant to be inclusive and and based on how people want sport to happen. Uh, then perhaps having all of this in the constitution is important because it allows those who are outside or on the fringes of the system to also challenge the system and say you need to change as well if you want to continue to survive. Thanks again, Sharda, as always, for taking the time to chat with us. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Daily Debrief. As always, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And don't forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice as well. We'll, of course, be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.